Psalm chapter 77. Let's look here at verse 1 of this chapter. This is a psalm of Asaph, and he says here, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated, and my spirit asked, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has, he, has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. I was, as I was reading through this, it's interesting, the dividing line here in these verses. It starts at verse 10. Verse 10 starts a totally different perspective than he sees in the very first nine verses of, of this psalm. It's amazing how perspective in life is so important to how our lives are lived. Perspective, of course, is how we view life. Some people look at life as the glass that's half full, the other people look at it as the glass, glass that is half empty, and it is all in our perspective of how we look at life. We can often look at life so incredibly negatively. Darla, we're Darla and I were talking about this on the way down to um, Harrisburg. I had a meeting down there, and, I, and we were talking about that as you get older, there's a tendency to get cynical, isn't there? And this, is <laughs> and this isn't a put down for any millennials that are here, but, you know, we, if I see a, a driver that's, you know, just driving really poorly, and I'm going, millennials, oh my, I don't know if they're millennials or not. It might be people my age, I don't know. But we just tend to get cynical about different things that are happening. We get cynical about our government, our country, our church, all kinds of things we can tend to be cynical about. And you can view life entirely in a negative in a negative light, we can get so easily discouraged in doing that, and we set ourselves up for failure. When we don't see anything good ever coming our way, then oftentimes it never does because we just won't see it anyway. The difference in perspective is whether or not I maintain an attitude of gratefulness. You know, whenever, whenever I am grateful, I am not thinking that I am, you know, that anything is coming to me that I deserve that. Then whenever, when anything happens, it becomes special. Like, I, I didn't expect this. I didn't think I deserved this. I didn't think it was supposed to be coming to me. And so it becomes a surprise when I am not thinking that I deserve something. So if I keep my heart forever grateful, every day wake up grateful, thank you, Lord, you have been so good to me, amazingly good, then my perspective is different all day long. I am not looking like, God, you will owe me something. You know how many years I've been serving you. It's not that attitude at all. It's, God, you blessed me with way more than I deserve. And anything that happens as a surprise that day is only icing on the cake. He has blessed us over and over again. I think sometimes in the United States that we have a sense of entitlement. We think that because we are Americans, we deserve certain things, or we deserve a certain lifestyle. We have in our, in our uh, Declaration of Independence that we have the right to be happy. And I'm, I'm sure that the founders of the Declaration of Independence weren't thinking of the word happy in the way that we think about it. I was telling the board on a devotion on Tuesday night that I was reading an article about Christian narcissism. And it's the idea that in Christianity, even sometimes, that attitude has creeped in. And, and, he, and the writer of that article says he's a, he's a, he speaks to young adults all around the world. And he said, oftentimes I will go to a young adult Bible study, 
And no matter what the teaching is on, they will say, you know what I'm getting out of this? That God wants me to be happy. And he goes, that wasn't what the teaching was about whatsoever. It wasn't about that. But we're, we're extracting that everything that, that, for, that God is saying to us, he's saying he wants to make us happy. Not necessarily. He wants to make us holy. And through holy, being holy, then he will make us content and satisfied. But not in the idea that we often think of. We think that we're entitled to all of that. Perspective is what gives us the right priority. It helps us to see the big picture. For a new mother that has young children, and it seems like, you know what, everything, everything that you do all day long is just simply changing diapers. Perspective gives her the encouragement to go on. It helps the struggling businessman to hang in there. It keeps teachers from losing hope. It gives them a glimpse of the impact they are making on the lives of their young students. I love this, and I've read this, and I maybe have used this here before, but a student wrote the following letter home to her parents. She writes, Dear Mom and Dad, I thought I'd drop you a note to clue you in on my plans. I've fallen in love with a guy named Jim. He quit high school after grade 11 to get married. About a year ago, he got a divorce. We've been going steady for two months, and we plan to get married in the fall. Until then, I decided to move into his apartment. Uh, by the way, I think I might be pregnant. At any rate, I dropped out of school last week, although I'd like to finish college sometime in the future. And then you turn over the page, and on the back side of that letter, the letter continued and said, Mom and Dad, I just want you to know that everything I've written so far in this letter is false. None of it is true. But Mom and Dad, this is true. I got a C- minus in French, flunked my math. It is true that I'm going to need a whole lot more money to pay for my tuition. So even bad news can sound good if you see it from a different perspective. I, mean, I imagine those parents, after reading the first page and then flipping it over, go, whoa, what a relief. No problem. We'll pay the tuition. That's okay. I heard a story um, a couple of years ago about a farmer who uh, he said to the Lord in praying, he said, I promise you, if you will ever give any of my cattle twins, I promise that I will give you one of the twins entirely. The income from that cow will go entirely to you. So one day, one of his calves has twins. He was absolutely thrilled about it. He said, you know, Lord, you did this thing. I promise you, I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to give you one of the twins, and when the cow grows up, I'm going to sell the cow. Whatever I get for it is entirely yours. One day he goes out, and he sees that one of the twins had died, very discouraged. Thought about it for a moment, and then he looked up to heaven, and he said, Sorry, Lord, you lost your cow. Perspective. <laughs> it's so important. So in the first nine verses of this psalm, Asaph doesn't have that perspective or the right perspective. He can't see God doing anything in his life. And oftentimes, you know, this is so relevant to where we lived. Oftentimes we look back over the years of our lives and we wonder why things have happened the way that they've happened. Maybe dreams that you had and, and, and you've gotten older and the dreams still haven't come true and you wondered what happened to all of those things. And you felt, you know what, maybe God gave me this dream and yet I still haven't seen the fulfillment of it. Maybe there were many things that you thought would succeed in your life, but they failed. Many times we look to people and people disappoint us. And so we end up viewing everything from that point on through the lens of those hurts that people have done to us. In the first 10 verses of this psalm, Asaph uses the personal pronouns 22 times. And I think that's usually a part of the problem here. He is focused on himself. He's not focused on God. And the results of focusing on himself are listed here. He says there in verse 2 that he's had a loss of sleep, can't sleep at night. He has a restless spirit. He has memories of things that he felt God should have done, but he didn't in verse 5. He questions the goodness of the Lord in verses 7 
through 9, he, he really wonders whether God has been good to him. It seems like he was maybe good in times past, but he isn't now. Whenever Joseph would think of God, he would remember of all the things that God used to do, and now he has a sense of thinking in the present, God, you quit doing anything good. You don't do anything recently that I can remember that is good. I remember the good old days, but you don't do anything good now. And it's a source of pain and hurt for Asaph. Asaph feels that God has forgotten to show his mercy, that he has not shown him his favor in a long time. He is not the same God that he used to be. It reminds me of John the Baptist. And, of course, you remember John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. His ministry, when it began, began to attract a lot of disciples. He was baptizing a lot of disciples. And then Jesus' ministry begins, and Jesus and his disciples begin baptizing, and many converts are coming to the Lord. And Jesus' ministry is increasing, and John the Baptist's ministry is fizzling out. It would be disappointing, I'm sure, to any one of us. On top of it all, John gets thrown into prison for preaching the gospel, for doing what Jesus wanted him to do. He gets thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. And so I'm sure while he's in there, he's maybe hearing of all the good things that Jesus is doing and the miracles that are happening. John, of course, naturally wants to be a part of that. But he's stuck in prison. And so he sends two disciples to talk to Jesus, and this is what he tells them to ask Jesus. He says, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Wow, strong words coming from John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one that was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. This man of God, he says, you know what? Are you the same Jesus that I was supposed to be forerunning for? Are you the one that is to come, or should we look for somebody else? I, I think all of us have been there at times. There's times in our Christian walk with the Lord that we look at what God is doing and say, God, that's not that's not you. you. You don't do things this way, and you're not doing anything especially for me. Where are you? Where, where's the God that I knew when I first got saved? Who, where's that God at? In Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 27, and you don't need to turn there. I'm not going to spend much time there, but there are, there are two disciples that are on the road to Emmaus there, and they're walking along, and the Scripture says that their faces are downcast. They're not even looking up. They're just looking at the road as they walk along with their feet. And Jesus comes along, and he starts walking with them, and they don't have a clue of who he is. And he begins to talk about the things that have happened, and they're like, what are you, a foreigner around here? Don't you, under, don't you know all of the things that have been going on? This Jesus that we, we, we served, and we were his disciples, and he died. Wow, we didn't expect that to happen from him. And the disciples told Jesus as they're walking along the road, but we had hoped that this would happen. We often say the same things. God, I, I had hoped that you would do it this way. I told you a couple of weeks ago about what we had hoped whenever we were fighting for the kids in the courts, and it just simply was not turning out that way. And we were like, God, but we had hoped you'd do it this way. Why not? Why aren't you doing it that way? We all go through situations like that where, we, where there are things that are happening in our lives now that are not the way that we would have hoped that God would have done it. We often say things like this, I, hope I, would, I would have hoped that I got the promotion at work. I would have hoped to have found the right person to marry by now. I would have hoped to have been in this career. I would have hoped my kids would have done this. We all are there. We all have these unmet expectations that we don't see being fulfilled, and it causes us discouragement. Oftentimes what we do as Christians, we will say, you know what, I, I want to do God's will, but then when it doesn't go and when he doesn't act the way that we, should, we think he should act, then we become very discouraged by that. In Scripture, whenever they are, the, the, the psalmists are talking about putting, putting their hope in God, it is not in, this, in the type of hope that I am going to determine how God does this. 
The kind of hope that they are placing in the Lord is the kind of hope that says, God, I'm putting my trust in you, and if it goes the way that I like it or if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. My hope's in you, Lord. It's not dependent on the way that you do it. It's dependent that I trust you. I know your character, God. I'm trusting in what you decide. Whatever way that is, my hope's in you, God. Whenever I look back on my own life, there are sometimes in my life, looking back, I didn't understand at the time, but looking back now, I'm so very thankful that the Lord said no. I was dating a girl for five years, and she went off to college. I didn't go to college, stayed at home. She went off to college. I thought that we were going to get married when she came home after her first year. But through that time in that first year of college, we began to drift apart. I was going in one direction. She was going in another direction. Eventually, she came home over Christmas. We broke up. And I was really, you know, I was really torn up about that. I thought this was the girl I was supposed to marry. A couple months, probably three months later, I met Darla. And, uh, and I, you know, at the time, whenever you're, you know, you're sad and you're tearful and all those kinds of things, you think, God, why don't you work out things the way that I want you to work things out? Well, boy, am I ever so thankful that he said no. So thankful. I... I have enjoyed a life with Darla that I could never imagine, the, the blessings of the wife that God gave me. Thankfully, he said no. And in so many different things of our lives, I, I remember telling Darla after we had the two girls, and, and I said, you know, I, I'm perfectly happy with two. Thank you, Lord. Two girls, we're done. We're good. Gabriel came along by an absolute surprise. And I am so thankful that God doesn't listen to what we say. He does what he wants to do, and he knows what's best for our lives, that we would simply welcome that. My life would have turned out so differently if I had always gotten what I demanded. So different. Thankfully, God knows better than just listening to all of our demands. He does what's best for us. He loves us that much. So as I said in verse 10 in this psalm, this, this psalm takes an absolute switch, and his perspective changes. In the finishing verses, he uses three personal pronouns and 22 references to the Lord. He sees God in these last verses in a whole new light. His perspective has been brought into focus here. He says that I will appeal to this thought. The thought that he's appealing to is that the years of the right hand of the Most High. I thought that was so re very interesting. All through Scripture, if you go through from the beginning on, there, there's references over and over again to the right hand of God. It's very specifically, the right hand of God, and it deals with that all the way through Scripture. I want to just talk about a number of them here this morning. In Deuteronomy 33.2, the right hand of God is spoken as the hand of law. It is the hand of arrangement. So in other words, when God is dealing with us, God never has a plan B. Never. It's always plan A. This is what I plan, and this is what's going to happen. He doesn't, he doesn't do a plan A and then go, you know, boy, that really didn't work, didn't work out very well. Let's try plan B or let's try, try plan C. He doesn't have those. He works very methodically with us. He works with the hand of arrangement. He's not, he's not like looking at us as guinea pigs and saying, you know what, I wonder what will work out. Let's try this. Let's try that. It isn't helter skelter like that. There is a plan that he has, and he's always working towards us. He is orderly. He is thorough in his dealings with us. God has plans for us, and they are very well thought out. They're not just, well, oh, here's, I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants. Let's see what works. God works with arrangement, with the, with the thought of, this is what my plans are, working very methodically. Secondly, in Psalm 48, verse 10, his right hand is referred to as the hand of righteousness. I don't have to worry 
that God will not do the right thing. He always does the right thing. He is the God that cannot lie. It's so interesting. You know, even in the best of, of people and, and people that you admire and all of that, if you watch them long enough, you will notice little things about their character, like all of us, that just tend to little disappoint you a little at times. It doesn't matter who it is. If you're watching them, you might have been, you might have admired your parents, and yet as you grew up with them, you knew there was these little things that maybe they would do from time to time that, that wasn't exactly right. We all have a sinful nature, and we're all wrestling with that, and thank God he's changing us, and he, he's transforming us into his image, but we're still wrestling with those things. We're not perfect yet. <laughs> But God isn't like that at all. It isn't one morning he ha wakes up and he has this little flaw. And he decides, you know what, I'm a little bit grouchy today. Stay out of my face, you guys. You want to get a flat tire? <laughs> Just keep messing with me. God doesn't, God doesn't have those kind of flaws. We're not serving an all-powerful God that at whim can go, you know what, I am in a bad mood, and boom. There, your house just caught on fire. I like that. That's not, that's not the God that we serve. It would, it would be dangerous serving a God like that. An all-powerful God that gets moody, that has these, these character flaws, that's not the God that we serve. This God is always good, always fair. He never does anything wrong. He doesn't lie. He, does, he always is doing the right thing in our lives. There is nothing that wavers with him whatsoever. He's not a politician that flips one way and flips the other way. He is always true, doing the right thing all the time. Psalm 20 verse 6 says that his right hand is spoken of as strength there. He is all-powerful. There is nothing out of his control. There is nothing in his definition of things that is impossible. He doesn't know that word. Everything is possible through him. He's not lacking in anything. One of the things I think as you get older, you realize that some of the things that you used to do when you're younger, you just can't do them anymore. We lack in strength. We have so many, so many disabilities. God has none of those. He doesn't lack in any strength at all. There are so many times in my life in my life, that I have let things get bigger and bigger and bigger. They were huge mountains in front of me. It's those moments that I need to refocus and say, God, you know what? That's, it's a mountain to me, but it's nothing to you. You're bigger than any mountain that we would ever face. You are the God that does amazing things. Asaph, he's down in the dumps, and he's so discouraged, but then all of a sudden he begins to remember, you know what? Your right hand did this miracle for us, and you helped us cross the Red Sea, and you did this, and you did that. He begins to remember, God, you are the God that nothing's too difficult for. You can do anything, God. Why am I so downhearted? You're the God that can do great things, great miracles, God. Then number four, in Song of Solomon 2, 6, God's right hand is referred to there as an emblem of caressing and tender love. Boy, I'm so thankful for that. You know, in, in our walk with the Lord, if you ever, when your kids were little, you know, maybe two, you know, we, we're taking one step, and their little legs are like taking three for every one of ours. And you ever seen when, you know, when you're impatient and you're in a hurry and you know you're late and you're taking your little two-year-old and, of course, he wants to walk. He doesn't want you to carry him. And so his little legs are running and you're trying to move him even faster and you're kind of, he's like skipping steps on the ground because you're pulling him so hard. Aren't you thankful that that's not what God does? We do that sometimes as parents. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't say, you know what, like you're the slowest walker. You have such little faith, Tim. I'm just going to have to drag you the whole way. He walks at the speed that you're able to walk, whatever that is. He's not running way ahead of you and say, shame on you. Can't you go any faster than that? He walks beside you, the Scripture says. 
And so if you're walking slow and you're not, you know, you're having doubts and you're not a man or woman of great faith, he's still there beside you. He didn't run off into the distance somewhere and then belittle you because you can't keep up. He walks there beside you. Whatever pace that you're willing to walk, whatever pace that you're at right now in your spiritual walk with the Lord, God is there alongside of you. He's tender in how he treats us. He's a gentleman. He deals with us in compassion and love. His mercies are new every morning. He's not belittling you because you can't keep up. He's leading you on. He's beside you. He's walking beside you. In Psalm 16, or Psalm 8, 118, verse 16, it says there that his right hand is the hand of action. You know, we, we procrastinate a lot of things. We, we promise that we're going to do this, and then, you know, we're all busy. Some things we get done, some things we don't get done. But God is methodically working his plan out, and, and he knows his plan ahead of time, and he's accomplishing what he wants to accomplish on his time schedule. He's not late. He's ne never early, maybe, too. He, he's methodically always directly on time with the schedule that he has. So he's not, he's not laying back, and he goes, you know what? I, I've been miss I just missed two weeks, and so and I need to catch up a little bit. It isn't that at all. God is a God who never takes vacations, never sleeps or slumber, the Scripture says. He's not backing out of his job because he gets tired. God is a God who is always in action. I, I read a book years ago that just so ministered to me, and it was written by Ron Mel, and the title of the book is that God works the night shifts. When you're sleeping, he's working. He never stops. He is always working, going before us. He's always methodically planning what he's going to do. He's a God of action, never lazy, never a slacker. He is always moving in direction for us. He's working for us all the time. And then lastly, in Psalm 16, verse 11, it says this, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. There is nobody that satisfies like the Lord. Each one of us, and we say this over and over again, but it is absolutely true, each one of us has a God-sized hole within each one of us. And we try to fill it with everything else. We try to fill it with things and achievements and relationships and all of those kinds of things, hoping that somehow those things will satisfy that God has left this huge hole inside each one of us that it will always be restless, always unsatisfied, always needing something else until we fill it with God himself. And then we realize really the meaning of life. The reason that we get up in the morning is because of him. He fills us and satisfies us like nothing ever else can. And so whenever we realize that, he said, his right hands provide eternal pleasures for us, not just what waits for us. From this moment on, eternal means. From this moment through ever, God is filling us and satisfying us over and over again that can only be filled by him alone. No one else can fill that emptiness in our hearts. Worship team, if you'd get ready to come. Asaph comes to the realization that God has our years, his years, in his right hand. You are completely safe there. You know what? We, we need the right perspective. The perspective that Asaph has from verse 10 on down, we need to keep that as the perspective of our lives. The Scripture says in Romans, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Jeremiah 29, 11, I used to write this at the bottom of every letter that I would send out. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, I, I, I end up talking to different people and many people that don't know the Lord. And, and I, you know, you know, too, we are living in a time when people are so fearful of so many 
different things. They're fearful of their lives. They're fearful of catching the coronavirus and dying. You know, I, I really have to say within my own heart, you know, I, I don't want to die of coronavirus any more than I want to get hit by a bus. But I'm not, I'm not staying up at night worrying about getting the coronavirus. I, it just, it never crosses my mind. If I die from the coronavirus, the Lord knew that it was time to go home. My years are in his right hand. I, I don't have to worry about that. If God is able to keep me in life, he will keep me in the valley of the shadow of death. I don't, I'm not worrying about that day that the time comes for me to meet him. I'm not, I'm not thinking about that. I'm, I want to serve God fully in the days that he gives me, and when my time comes to go, thank God, we'll be home. And so I'm not staying up night and worrying about, boy, if I catch that thing, man, I might die from that. Not at all. Not that I'm a great man of faith by any means. I'm just simply saying, Lord, we're going to trust you. We, are, we cannot do anything else. We put our lives into your hands. And when that moment comes for us to meet you face to face, it will be worth it all. We sang the chorus for years. It'll be worth it all when we see him face to face. And so I'm not worried about that day. I'm not, I'm not fretting over, worrying I'm going to get this. Or I'm, you know, if you drive out on 30, you're putting your life at risk every single day. There is no guarantee of tomorrow for any one of us. So I'm not going to worry about when that day comes. He'll be, his grace will be sufficient when the day that he takes me home. I'm going to live fully for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust him in the middle of all the fear that is in our culture, in our country, in this world, I'm going to trust God because my life is in his right hand. My moments, my days, my months, my years are in his hand, and I'm going to focus on him. He has got good plans for each one of you, plans that prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Let's trust him. Amen. Amen. 